I'm uh, Daniel Kirikesh. I'm part of the Net DevOps team here at uh, WorldPay. Uh, or more exactly, a part of the team that uh, handles cloud uh, infrastructure in AWS. So, I think uh, I'd like to thank my team for being here tonight to support. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, the the agenda today uh, is around uh, a change that uh, we realize is happening in the team. So, it's basically the fact that uh, we are. Uh, writing less code, but at the same time, we are achieving more. So um, one of the reasons were, uh, was that we were uh, switching gradually to using the declarative DevOps paradigm instead of the more traditional imperative one. So we'll see what that means. And uh, that allowed us also to kind of share ownership uh, uh, with uh, various teams, so kind of hand over the management of uh, infrastructure components. And uh, yeah, we'll briefly take a look at uh, the declarative tools that uh, helped us achieve this. So yeah, the famous uh, DevOps tool stack. Uh, it's yeah, probably not even the tip of the iceberg here, but um, the idea is that uh, there are now uh, many, many uh, roles and responsibilities that uh, you know, the DevOps uh, team has. So, you know, the CI CD part with uh, the application lifecycle, the pipelines and everything else, setting up the infrastructure, uh, managing cloud migrations, uh, handling security compliance, the observability part, you know, monitoring, logging, alerting, and everything that comes with it. And the cultural shift that's kind of challenging our soft skills at time, so, uh, that's uh, important as well. So yeah, um, declarative versus imperative. So what that means? Declarative means uh, to focus on the kind of the target rather than how you are getting there. So you are defining the desired state of uh, you know your let's say infrastructure component instead of uh, you know thinking about the steps on how to get there. So I just gave a quick example related to uh, creating an EC2 instance in AWS with the two different paradigms. So on the left, it's the imperative approach. It's using a Python script, but it could have been anything else. Um, and uh, you can see the code, and on the right, you have the declarative uh, one that's being written in the Terraform. And I also mentioned here that uh, this one is still incomplete while the, uh, the one on the right is complete. And why is that? Because if you're running this thing, uh, you know, twice, it will fail, right? First time it will create the instance and then the second time it will complain that it's already there. So you'll have to, you know, um, add more code to, to the Python script to actually handle the entire or the full life cycle of that component. With the declarative one, it's just that. You can run it multiple times, right? It's idempotent. You could probably add you know, multiple attributes, but it's all staying in the same block, and it's not really much to it. So it's a great way to define things. And uh, yeah, giving uh, some examples of tools that we're using, and one of them, are, uh, one of them is the Kubernetes operator. And, uh, it's, it's one that we like a lot because it's very powerful, right? So a Kubernetes operator is just an application that runs in Kubernetes. Basically, when you would install that, you would see a pod running. That's all that it is, in essence. But it's very powerful because then on top of it, you could add custom resources. So you could manage, uh, you know, this kind of things and many more, right? You could have clusters. DBs, orchestrators, uh, monitoring stuff, AWS resource. So you can probably add an operator that you know uh, helps you create and manage the lifecycle of AWS resources. So it's very powerful. But it's more than that. It's it's that thing called the control loop. And uh, what's happening is that you are uh, pushing a custom resource, let's say a definition for a VM, right, in AWS, an EC2 VM. And 
the operator watches for these kind of resources and then goes to the API. It's Kubernetes API in this picture, but if you're talking about AWS, it will be the AWS API and will create the object. And it's not just that, it continues to monitor the custom resource. So if I'm updating that custom resource, then it will go and update the object in AWS. And some operators are actually doing it in reverse as well. And it's one of the things that we also like. So for example, if someone goes and manually, you know, updates things on, on uh, AWS, then uh, the operator, you know, does the diff, sees that it doesn't match the resource any longer, and then it just updates, uh, you know, the object to match whatever we have in the code. So uh, it's kind of a continuous validation and self-filling instead of running things at times. So yeah, we, we like this a lot. And then how would you deploy such an operator, right? It's uh, one of the options, so there are many options, right? You could use anything that can handle uh, Kubernetes manifest because in essence, it's just YAMLs, right? We are using Helm. It could have been, uh, you know, Ansible. It could have been kubectl. It could have been uh, bash script maybe. But uh, Helm is another uh, declarative powerful tool. So it's a one-liner to get the operator installed uh, uh, in the Kubernetes cluster, and then we can jump on actually creating the objects. So we have, uh, you know, these two blocks of code, but uh, they're very powerful. So the first one would deploy an entire setup for a Grafana, right? Uh, uh, for the Grafana tool. So by just uh, pushing this uh, custom resource definition here, you would already have Grafana running in the Kubernetes cluster. And then by using another object that the operator supports, you would be able to create a dashboard. So um, yeah, one of the things that's worth mentioning here is that you don't see any API calls and no, no URLs. And that doesn't mean they're not there, it's just that the operator internally, you know, kind of manages that. So uh, it, yeah, exposes this kind of cool thing of, of managing things. Now I mentioned Helm, right? So um, Helm is just a, a package a management tool for Kubernetes. I like to call it a template mechanism, but it's not just that. We're going to see uh, a bit later. So uh, I really like this quote from the official website from Helm, which says, start using Helm, stop the copy paste. Because we've seen a lot uh, uh, of, you know, bad practices like uh, having some YAMLs for your application and kind of see the same thing in hundreds of repos. So this is, uh, yeah, what uh, Helm does. It allows you to create a chart which is kind of a, you know, um, a model or a pattern to deploy your application. And then uh, it allows you to customize that. So the chart is just a collection of YAMLs, right? But it, they're not in their pure form. So you would have to add variables for things that you want to change and then come with a values YAML file that, you know, replaces the variables inside uh, the YAMLs and you, uh, actually can have right, uh, some default values for your organization. So this is yeah, kind of what happens uh, you know, when you are deploying things with a Helm chart. So you have the development phase right, where you're authoring your Helm chart and then the users could just invoke the chart, pass the values, and you can deploy to a Kubernetes cluster. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to give a quick example, right? So let's say we have a pod, right? So this is the YAML definition for a pod. It's simple. You deploy this and it goes into the Kubernetes cluster and creates an uh, Nginx web server, right? But then you want to make uh, things a bit more scalable, right? You want to have a way to maybe pass some values. So now you can split things, right? You move the pod into a template 
you add a variable and then get the values outside uh, of the actual YAML. So now you could, obviously it's a very basic example, but when you are using more complex ap applications, it becomes very powerful. And there's the other thing that we kind of like with it. It's, it's not just the templating part, so it's making the deployment pipelines declarative. So I just took a quick example of, uh, let's say, a database application, classic one, right? You are having a v1.0, you want to deploy v1.1, and in between you have some DB migrations to be uh, executed. What would happen in a classical approach, right? You would have the pipeline that, uh, you know, will, would run the script, would validate some things. Okay, did they pass? It's all fine. If not, you probably have to bake some kind of rollback mechanism. With Helm, it's just an annotation. So you would create a specific pod, right? You would have the migrations defined there. And just by using this kind of pre-install annotation, Helm knows automatically to not deploy your application, run this task as a pre-deployment task, actually. Then if all, were, uh, if all was fine, it deploys next version. And maybe you have some post-deployment tasks as well, which are, again, uh, achieved by using uh, a similar annotation. So it's all in a YAML file. It's no pipeline involved. So that's kind of cool again. Now for a summary, right, um, um, you have the templating part, you have the parameterization part, you have the versioning thing and the rollbacks. And uh, it's also the community support because uh, when we took a glance at that uh, DevOps tool stack at the beginning, almost all of that stuff can be deployed using a Helm chart. So we will uh, we'll check you know, a repository for a tool on GitHub, you would see the Helm chart folder as well. And that means it's kind of becoming a standard way of, uh, of deploying things. Okay, so uh, um, we have Helm and we have the YAML uh, files and the custom resources and the operators. How do we deploy them? We still need a way to push these things into Kubernetes. So it's Terraform. Uh, um, everyone knows the tool, right? Infrastructure as code. Uh, what we kind of like about it is, uh, sorry, it's, it's this thing here. Uh, with the uh, planning and approval step, right? So it has the ability to run a plan on your code and you know, show you what is being changed in infrastructure without ac uh, actually executing that. So you can have groups of people and reviewers that can check the plan and then push things further. So um, then it has uh, ability to create modules, right? It's grouping common resources um, uh, in, in modules, so uh, you have a simpler way to package things and share it with the other teams. And then the parallelism, which kind of, uh, you know, uh, run and deploys infrastructure components. Uh, if they're independent, they run in parallel, right? So it makes thing, uh, things quicker. And the ecosystem is uh, what we've seen with the community support for Helm as well you could probably find Terraform modules or resources for, you know, it's obviously the three big cloud providers, but there are so many other things that can be deployed with, uh, with Terraform. Now, yeah, this could be kind of boring, but it's, uh, uh, it's the last one that's being technical. So uh, uh, I just wanted to show the way that we are doing things uh, because, you know, one of the topics is empowering other teams to use uh, our code. So I just wanted to show how we achieve that. So I was going to start with the same YAML file for creating the Grafana dashboard at the beginning, right? So having this is kind of useless because now if you want to create a different dashboard, you would have to just duplicate this object, right? And change the parameters. So it becomes a bit difficult to maintain. But then you could put this into a Kubernetes manifest in Terraform. 
So now uh, this block of code does the same thing, but you can run it with Terraform and having all the Terraform advantages. But still, it's not being useful because you know you need another dashboard. You duplicate the same resource here. So now it's the templating mechanism in Terraform this time that helps with that. So you grab this YAML code, put it into a Terraform template, and start adding variables, right, for things that you know will uh, be modified in your organization. Now you have the template. So you could get this block here and replace things to use the template. So instead of defining the actual parameters, you are invoking the template and passing values to variables. So we're kind of there, but not there yet, right? We still have a single component to be deployed. So now the powerful thing is being able to define variables, right? So you can have a file where you could define multiple dashboards, uh, different values, and uh, in the end, you would uh, use uh, a loop, right, over this variable, and then uh, invoking the template. So now this, you know, could be passed or could be uh, shared with other teams to manage. And you can focus then on developing new features. Okay, kind of a summary here. So uh, uh, some best practices, uh, obviously the uh, uh, simplified or declarative code that I've shown before, standardization via templates, so uh, things look the same across the organization, advanced declarative techniques, the thing that I've shown before with having loops over maps or list of objects, or let's say uh, various uh, string manipulation functions in Terraform for whenever you have some edge cases that you want to handle. And then maintain either team level or organization level helm charts, whatever fits. And uh, the modules uh, to group common resources in Terraform. And um, um, yeah, not mentioned here, but uh, obviously uh, packaging and versioning everything so you have uh, you know, high confidence whenever you want to promote things to upper environments in a consistent and scalable way. So yeah, I think uh, that's all. If you have any questions.